we are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams. World losers and world forsakers upon whom the pale moon gleams, yet we are the movers and shakers of the world forever it seems. Hi, I'm Jamie Hernandez, and this is the Ins and Outs with Mackie, a show about awesome gear and awesome people. We'll be bringing you musicians, engineers, podcasters, streamers, and sometimes the occasional Macoid. If you're new to the channel, make sure to hit that subscribe button on your favorite platform to get all the latest Mackie updates as soon as they are out. Today, we are joined by the founder and CEO of Little Kids Rock, a nonprofit organization that is the leading provider of free curriculum and instruments across the U.S., he has initiated and managed the launch of campaigns to restore, expand, and innovate music education for more than 1 million students in 44 states. As kids return to a school year unlike any other, we're going to be discussing how the impact of music education is so important now more than ever. Welcome to the show, David Wish. Thank you so much, Jamie. Really a pleasure to be here with you. How's it going today? How are you doing? How are you feeling at this moment? Well, I get to work with kids and teachers, so even in times where a normal person feels maybe a little <laughs> bummed out or, or cynical. I feel optimistic and hopeful because um, that's what working with kids does to a person. Well, wonderful. Let's keep that optimism going. Let's start at the beginning. Um, tell us a little bit more about yourself. I know you did quite a bit even before Little Kids Rock even started. Can we begin there? Sure. I mean, I think the most important thing is that um, as a little boy, I loved music but I was convinced that I wasn't very musical. Um, and, um, you know, ironically, some of those ideas about my own music, I got from my school music program. You know, uh, like my choir teacher asked me to just maybe mouth the words, not sing them. And um, I really wanted to play the guitar. That's what I really wanted to do in my heart of hearts. But there was no guitar being taught at my school. I was fortunate to have a music program and I got the closest thing I could find to a guitar it was this little teeny thing they called a violin. And it looked kind of like a guitar, <laughs> except you, you know, you did this with it. And so um, after the novelty wore off, you know, I was like, I, what can I play on this that moves me? And I was listening to like the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix. So I thought, I know that song. So I ran to my music teacher and I said, you know, I won't say his name. Hey, would you teach me to play that song, Eleanor Rigby? It uses one of these, I'm pretty sure. And he <laughs> said, um, no, you know, you get that music at home. We don't do that in school. So I dropped out a violin. Um, someone tried to teach me to play jazz drums, but I really wasn't a jazz person. You know, I was a little kid. I was listening to different music. So I just thought I was going to be this non-musical person who would just love music and spend all of my extra money on records and whatever, but I wouldn't be for something for me to do. And then in high school, I had a friend named Paul Brill who taught me to play guitar and boom, that changed my life forever. And it was very different the way he taught me than the way music programs in schools had taught me. You know, they told me what to play, when to play it. It was never any music that felt uh, important or uh, connected to my life in any way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Paul, the first day, is like, well, what do you want to learn how to play? I'm like, oh, I don't know, you 2 The Grateful so Dead, The Clash, like any of it, all of it. And so, yeah, he, he did what is one of the most dangerous things you can do. He taught me three chords. And boom, you know, my life sort of changed forever and I became an obsessive music maker myself and learned to play lots of different instruments over time. So, so then, uh, to the extent that I grew up, which is debatable, I became a first grade <laughs> school teacher myself. So I was teaching first grade. And um, after a little while, it started to bum me out that my school didn't have a music program. And it had been a long time since I had thought about any formal music education. And when I decided, when I, you know, I decided that, well, there's no music here, but I play. So why don't I just teach my kids to play 
and they'll have fun and I'll have fun. It'll be a hoot. It'll be awesome. I just need to come up with 30 guitars somehow. Um, so I begged and borrowed a bunch of guitars from my musician friends who owed me uh, favors or money or usually both. Um, <laughs> you know, hey, I know you've got that guitar or whatever under your bed. You know, could you lend it to me? I'm doing this thing with my kids. And I started, um, in addition to teaching first grade, teaching all my first graders how to play guitar. And like a good teacher, I thought, well, I need a curriculum. So I went to the music store and I started looking for method books and I saw, you know, vo guitar volume one, you know, when the saints go marching in merrily, we roll along whoosh, another one, you know, how to play guitar by so-and-so red river Valley, you know, froggy went a court. And whoosh. so I got to the bottom. I'm like, I can't teach any of this. I don't want to teach it. I don't think my kids want to learn it. So my first day of class, I came in, well, guitar class, after I got all the guitars, I was like, well, what do you want to play? Like, cause that's how I learned. And they're like, yeah. Ricky Martin, Selena, <laughs> the Backstreet Boys. So I was like, all right, so that's what we'll do. So I started teaching the kids to play in a way that was quite different from the way that I was introduced in school. Did not start with reading and theory and all of that. Just started with like, oh, we're going to do Bitty Bitty Bum Bum by Selena. And I'm thinking, okay, it's in B flat, it's a one, four, five, oh, let's just do it in A. Okay, we need to learn the A, the D, and the E chord. And then what, what, what I noticed happened very quickly is, you know, we were all on fire for it. Every, I mean, like we, I would teach first grade all day and then we couldn't wait after school. We'd all get together and we'd learn to play their favorite songs. And I had a, an incredible time and they had an incredible time. And then... Um, so here's a really interesting part of the story, especially for your viewers, Jamie. Um, my kids started writing their own songs, you know, and I, you know, I remember the first time one of my students came up to me, his name was Sergio, and he'd written a song. I was like, you wrote a song? And he's like, you want to hear it? I'm like, well, yeah. So he plays me this song. It's a killer song. It's called Little Dinosaur. And, <laughs> um, and then a couple of weeks later, Another kid, Esmeralda, comes up to me and she's like, you know, hey, Mr. Wish, I wrote a song. I'm like, two geniuses in one class? Like, what are the odds of this? <laughs> and so, so, yeah, I want to hear it. And, you know, by degree, basically all of my kids were writing songs. And it was blowing my mind, you know, and then, and I'm a slow learner. So, you know, it wasn't that I started to understand like, well, wait a minute, maybe there's something about the way we're learning together that's making this possible for those kids. But anyways, so here's where our lives interconnect. I started recording albums of my kids' <laughs> original music. This is my original Mackie mixer, which I would bring to the school to record CDs and tapes. Actually, first it was tapes and then, <laughs> then CDs. Wow. And, and we started selling those tapes and CDs to raise money. Why? Because all the second graders wanted to be in my guitar class, and I had run out of musicians to bother to, to get instruments from. So we started selling tapes and CDs and I started buying more instruments so I could start a second guitar class, a third one, a fourth one, etc. And people started to notice. There were a lot of um, like artists who lived at some local radio stations started playing my kids' music. Oh, how right? cool. Yeah, like KFOG Radio, Peter Finch, great guy. He's worked with us now for years. Started playing the original music and that attracted the attention of people who lived nearby, like Carlos Santana oh, and man. Bonnie Raitt and, and John Lee Hooker, may he rest in peace. And um, I started to understand that, you know, there was a huge opportunity to bring music to kids who otherwise would never have it. So um, when I started to see like, you know, hey, I'm raising money, I'm able to buy instruments. What if I start teaching other people besides me what I'm doing with these kids, this new sort of um, less traditional approach to music education? Maybe we could bring music to kids in other schools. So in 2002, I left the classroom and started Little Kids Rock as a nonprofit. Um, and we were super grassroots, super bootstrap. You know, I was a first grade school teacher. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have a background in business, but I had seen the incredible impact 
that music had on kids. And by the way, I'll go back just to give you a sense of that. So that little boy I told you about named Sergio who wrote that song. Um, after he graduated, I got a call from his mother who was, who was weeping, you know, and I, it was hard to hear her, but what I, when I finally understood what was going on, she was explaining to me that Sergio's older brother had died unexpectedly the night before um, of pneumonia. He'd gone to the hospital, they sent him home, and he died in his sleep. And would I come to the funeral? So, I was, you know, of course. So I went to the funeral. And when you go into an environment like that, all you want to do is help. But like, you know, what can you do? But I felt really lucky because when I got there, there was Sergio, but there were also all of the other kids that had been in his class and in his guitar class because they were tight, right? Music brings people together and it keeps people together. So I was like, okay, well, I will sit with the kids because I can. They're my, they're my students. And that'll give the adults a little bit more room to grieve. And I'll never forget it, but while I was sitting with Sergio, you know, um, he reached under the, uh, his chair and pulled out a guitar and played a song that he had written for his brother the night before. And for me, that story encapsulates the totality of what music does for the whole human family. It's like, yeah, he wrote that song. It was Little Dinosaur. It was joy. It was so happy. It was like you get married and you have a band or you, you're, you, you bond with your friends and whatever. But music runs the entire gamut. And when life hits you hard, and it will, it hits everybody hard. Music is one of the few things that matters, right? Well, I mean, what, what a big house, a big bank account. If you're lucky, the things you discover that matter in your life are the people that love you and that you love, your health, if you're fortunate enough to have it. And then what? Music's one of those incredible things. So, you know, it was through stories like that and experiences like that that I decided, like, I just have to, I love teaching first grade. I thought that was going to be my life's career. But like, if I'm honest, I got to try this thing. So we went from, you know, working in just a few schools back in 2002, and it was a few more, then it was a few more. And, um, you know, zooming forward now, at this point, you know, Little Kids Rock has trained and equipped over 5,000 public school music teachers and general ed teachers, regular classroom teachers, who collectively have brought the transformational gift of music education to over a million students uh, across the United States. Yeah, so, so that's the that's the... 10 minute version of the last 20 years. Well, that's, that's really inspiring. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so that leads us to the remarkable Little Kids Rock. Can you provide a quick rundown um, of what Little Kids Rock is for people who may be hearing about this program for the first time? Like, how does the application process work, for example? Sure. So Little Kids Rock is a nonprofit that um, re restores music programs when they've been eliminated, expands them when they're there, and innovates them everywhere we go. Um, and innovates them by helping teachers understand how to use technology to teach music, how to use the music of today to teach today's children. How do people apply? So we generally work with entire school districts, um, big and small. In fact, we work with over 500 public school systems around the United States today. And the way that we work is we, we tend to go into districts where 50% or more of the students are in free and reduced lunch, which is a government way of saying uh, low-income communities or uh, under underfunded schools, what have you. And we let them know hey, listen, we've raised these funds from philanthropy, from donors. We can build a music program in your district if you would like that. Um, they generally say, yes, we would like that very much. Of course. Um, and it's really, you know, it's been very grassroots. Like, um, you know, it's funny. I was, so we have teachers who spread this program through word of mouth. Hey, you know, I was really struggling, et cetera. And I, this program called Little Kids Rock came in and I da da da. Well, what's that? I don't know what that is. Well, let me tell you what it is. And da 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 da. Oh, wow. I want to try that. So then we hear, you know, from friends of a friends of a friends. And then the same thing has happened with funders, right? So, mm -hmm. for example, you know, we fund a program in Tennessee. Uh, we have a great program in Nashville and um, Usher finds out that there's this great music program in Nashville and he's from um, uh, Chattanooga. And he's like, okay. well, hey, could we do it in Chattanooga? 
And we said, sure, let's do a fundraiser. So he did a fundraiser for us, and now we're going into Chattanooga. You know, um, it's not to say that there's not strategy. And in fact, m more recently, over the last um, I don't know five to ten years, we've gotten a lot more strategic. But there's a lot of just natural growth that comes from district next to a district, teacher next to a teacher, funder knowing another funder, um, and the success of our teachers' programs breeds interest and success from other people, you know, who want, who want that same success for their kids or for their community. So tell us more about your team. I know you have some teachers and a lot of people who back up Little Kids Rock as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about what they do? Sure. So um, we have a staff of about 30 people uh, full time. Those people um, write the curriculum that we share with our teachers. They take the best ideas from our teachers and share them across our network. Um, we have uh, the uh, trainings that are that we used to do in person. When, remember when in person was a thing? And that's one of the other things that the team that I work with is doing now, especially now, is pivoting to this new environment that our teachers, our kids, and their families. Uh, and everybody are finding themselves. Wow. So, so right now, that's like 96% of the kids that we serve are not receiving continuous in-person instruction. This is hugely disruptive, as you can imagine, to education in general. But, it's, but think about music, right? You can't, make, like, you can't make music together synchronously at the same time online. So yeah. what do you do? Well, that's where innovation comes in. And, um, you know... Like if you run a marching band and your vision of music education is I sit at the front of the room or the front of the field and I tell everybody what to read and where to go, well, you can't do that anymore. So one of the things that the kind of music programming that, we're, that we do provides to music teachers, especially now, is a way to let kids come to music that's not so teacher-directed but is much more student-directed right? Um, so teaching kids to compose, teaching kids to improvise, teaching kids to, to um, you know, so for example, you know, if you're a marching band teacher and you, you know, you can't get your kids together, can you say, hey, what songs do you like? Well, I like this song. Okay, great. Well, you're, you're a trumpet player. What could you play over that song? You know, how could you comp along with it? How could you improvise over it? So there's that kind of stuff that's going on. We're teaching our teachers to do online recording with their kids. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of innovation that's happening right now in the field. And our staff is right at the forefront of making that happen yeah. because we're not in the creative field for nothing, right? If anybody can make lemonade out of lemons, it's us. If it, anybody can find a creative solution, if a, if a musician can't find a creative solution, we're, we're in trouble. So <laughs> definitely. So let's get, let's get back into the program itself. So something sure. that really stands out about, uh, about the program is that you educate using a variety of genres like rock and pop and Latin and even rap. Um, and this seems to be empowering the teachers um, to build music programs that are as diverse as their students are. How important is, is this for, for you all? Well, to me, it's critically important. I, I started off by telling you that I was alienated by my own experience of music education. I didn't feel it was right for me. I didn't feel like I was wanted in my own music class. Mm -hmm. Um, because I didn't fit a certain kind of, you know, role that the teacher was looking for, for me. Um, I think there are as many ways of being musical as there are of being human. And I also think that it's the job of a music educator to draw the music out, not to drum it in. So. Well said, well said. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I think it's true. I think there are two main ways that you can teach music. I don't think one is better than the other. And I think that neither one of them works for every person. You can teach music as a math. And when you teach music as a math, it's one right answer to every question and an infinite number of wrong answers. Right. So if the score says play this, it says play that and you didn't play that. So this was wrong and that was right. But if you teach music like a language. Then there's actually a lot of different potential right answers. Like if I ask you, how are you today with a language question and you say, eh, or you say, I'm doing great. Both answers are right. Right. But if I tell you what is five plus five and you tell me that it's 12, well, that's a wrong answer. So 
there's a place for both of them. I think that one of the challenges that a lot of children face in public school music programs is many, that many teachers only know the mathematic approach. And you lose a lot when you only have one of the two major tools that I think you could have in your tool belt. Probably a lot of people know what it felt like uh, when I was a kid. If you ask people, hey, are you a musician? Well, you know, when I was a kid, I took like violin lessons or piano lessons and I hated it and I, you know, or I wasn't any good at it and I quit. And then the punchline is always, and now I wish I could play. Well, the good news is for those people is I blame your teacher. I don't blame you. It's always the teacher's responsibility. If it didn't work for you, they should have pivoted. They should have found another set of uh, ways of allowing you to become the musical, you know, to express your musicality. And so, yeah, yeah that's, what, that's what the program is really geared for, is to make sure that kids of any, you know, all kids have the, the way to express their musicality that, that works for them, not that works for their teacher, because of course their teacher works for them, right? We, we're, we're here to serve the kids, not the other way around. Absolutely. And that's a great point because um, in your, you had a great TED talk and you, you talk a lot about filters and how people correlate you know, their, their past musical experience with, you know, I can picture it. You even throw a picture up on the screen with the, the teacher with the ruler that would slap your hands at the piano every note you hit, you know? So that could be very discouraging and it's important that teachers like you said, they pivot to to find what does work, and you all seem to have have gotten there. So thank you for 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 being open to that um, and all the possibilities that are out there. So, um, so your teaching method, you you refer it to uh, music as a second language. I love that, and this is interesting because it's often stressed that you should learn a second language while you're young. What are your thoughts on that statement? Uh, it's interesting. What linguists have found is that. Um, if you ask an average person that you should, you know, shouldn't you learn while you're young, that a lot, most people say, yeah, you'll learn it much more quickly. But the thing that's, that what linguists have found is that adults and kids actually, if they're in the same circumstances, learn at the same rate. In fact, adults have a slight advantage at first because they've already truly become proficient in their native language and they may know grammar so they've got some shortcuts oh i can conjugate a verb but that falls away after a little while and it basically takes three to five years for anybody to become fluent in a language if you use it but if you're feeling shame if you're feeling self-conscious if you're feeling judged then you will clam up. If a baby were to say to their mother, mama milk, right? The mom is not going to say, uh, hold on, that's not, ang- that's not a <laughs> sentence, right? I think what you're trying to say is mama, I want some milk or mom, can I have milk? Could, could you try to say that? Wait, would it help if I wrote it down? Like the reason why that feels like such a silly thing and it flies in the face of the way we you know, it, it almost, it's all, not, not quite offensive, but like jarring. It's like, dude, the kid wants milk. Like what part of mama milk do you not understand? Yes. Language is intended to communicate. It's not actually intended above all else to be grammatically correct. If it communicates, it intends its primary purpose. If it follows grammatic rules, et cetera, that's ancillary. And it'll come with time. Who cares? The important thing is that the child is communicating. I feel the same way about music. You know, it's not about being right or wrong or grammatically correct. It's like, oh, yeah, you're playing that that song that you love by, you know, Adele. I hear it. I recognize it. I feel (laughs) it. Great. Good on you. Let's keep going. And do you think the language of music allows them to express themselves more freely now? I think that, um, you know, music is an abstract language. So, so you know, it, it, it works like a magic potion on everything it touches, including the people. I mean, Bob Marley said it well, you know, like when music hits you, you feel no pain, you know? And I love that because hit, you know, you think of hit as like, boom, and it does do that. It just socks you, but, yeah. but but you're better for it. So, you know, when I think about music education and arts education in general, I think about them as an investment in the greatest natural resource that we have as human beings, which is to say 
the creativity of the next generation, the creativity of our children. I think of that as the most precious natural resource we have because when you look at all of the uh, intractable social problems that we grown-ups have created, they're only going to be solved by someone's creativity. And it's probably going to be solved by someone who didn't start the problem in the first place. I think that's going to be our kids. So when you invest in our children's creativity, you're really investing, I think, in the solution to all of our problems. Um, and of course, music and the arts have a very special role to, to play on that. That It's not to say that you can't do the same thing with math and science and social. So everything's got a place, but that, that place is unique and special. And music's place is unique and special. And that's why, you know, I just think like we have to do everything we can to ensure that it's being taught in our schools and that it's being taught fairly in a way where every kid can find their path. If it's jazz, it's jazz. If it's rap, it's rap. If it's making beats, it's making beats. Whatever, that doesn't matter. What matters is getting those, that agency into kids' hands, into their lives. That's what really matters. How how do we inspire these children and and quite frankly just people in general to to be creative? You know, there's a lot of people out there that have difficulty articulating their thoughts and their feelings. Um, how do we get there? How do we inspire them to to go this direction? Well, of course, you work at a company that's all about <laughs> building <laughs> the tools, right? Yeah, so, so I could I could just as easily ask you, but I, I think that people are scared to be creative sometimes because they fear being judged. In fact, I'll, I'll share a story. They did a study with children where they give them paper and crayons and they say, draw a house. And the kids are like, okay, I'm drawing a house. They draw the house and they fill up the page with a big house. And they're like, see my house? Yeah, great. Then they do it with another group of children. They say, draw a house, but that we want the house to have two stories. So the kids draw a house and it takes up a little bit less of the paper. It takes a little bit longer and they show it. And the more direction they give, the less and less of the paper they use and, and, and the more um, hung up they become and the more anxious they become. So, and, and, and I think there's a deep lesson in that. If I tell you, Jamie, draw a house, you know what the implicit message I'm giving you is? You know how. I don't have to tell you. You can do this. If I tell you, draw a house, but I want it to have a chimney and a picket fence and a, and you know a front door that's on there, it's like now it's like, well, you maybe you don't really know how to draw a house, but I will show you how. And I what I've done is I've made you less. I've taken away your expertise. I've taken away leveraging what's natural, what you might just do naturally. That's what I talk about drumming it in. Draw the music out. Don't drum it in. You know, another thing that we say is a lot of times, like when we're training our teachers, D comes before E in the alphabet. So do something before you explain it. What do I mean by that? So if I was going to teach a kid how to play this thing that's a drum set behind there for your viewers who have never seen one this is called a cymbal now if i was teaching a little kid how to play a drum set i could say okay we're going to play a beat now beats in the music you like are generally in four four and people generally here this is the hi-hat and generally people just play either quarter notes or eighth notes on that and then they generally play another note on two and four on the stair it's like that's a lot of information and that's all math or i could say go like this can you do this? Good. Now, while you're doing that, I want you to hit your knee. Check it out. Go ba, ba, together and ba, and together, just like this. Yeah, great. Now we're going to go on the drum set. Try to do that. Hit the stick on there and now do both. And now all of a sudden, the kid's going, you know, and if a kid's doing that and I get on a bass, I'm like, or whatever I'm doing, a piano thing. All of a sudden, it's like that mama milk conversation that we just had. It's like, wait a minute, I'm talking, you're listening, we're, we're, we're in a musical <laughs> communication. This is awesome. I want more of it. And I've just drawn the music out because I know that any kid can do this, just, you know, just about and, and or do that. And by the way, if the kid can't do that, then they can do something else. And if I can't figure it out, then I, then I should look for another line of work because <laughs> that's my – that's my gig, man, is like, I'm going to make you musical, you know, I'm going to, or not make you musical, excuse me, I'm going to 
empower you to express your musicality. And you do a great job doing that, David. So, <laughs> so you serve economically disadvantaged communities. How often do you come across a school that has absolutely no music program to speak of? Frequently. And, and when that happens, we train general ed teachers. A general ed teacher might be like a third grade teacher or a, a high school uh, math teacher or whatever. They might be teaching it one day a week after school. But the, the, the principal sees what that's doing for their school. And they say, you know, hey, Mrs. Hernandez or Mr. whatever, you know, would you consider being the school music teacher? Because I can get another third grade teacher or whatever, but I really dig what you're doing. And I want you to do it for the whole school. So that happens, um, you know, with some degree of regularity within our program. Um, most often when we go into a school like that, we're able to start a smaller program that might reach 30 or, you know, so kids. If there's a music teacher, of course, we can reach hundreds of kids. So for we who believe in music and kids, you know, we have to really stand up and say, look, this is, this is, this is critical. You know, our teachers in this environment, I like to say, are the emotional first responders that our children need. You know, they're bringing something to them. Like I said, in the story I was telling earlier about Sergio, that in downtimes is, it's almost like oxygen. It's invaluable. So, um, you know, I would encourage people who want to get involved to visit our website, littlekidsrock.org. I would encourage people who want to learn more about how they can advocate in their community and speak up to go to nam.com and, and not, not, not .com, .org, N -A -M -M org. They have all kinds of advocacy tools and research so that, you know, a concerned parent can go virtually to the principal and say, listen, it, this is why we have to keep this music program. Or if they don't have one, this is why we need one. So from, from a gear and products perspective, um, what, are, what are tools and, and things teachers and schools are, are currently needing right now? Well, for our program, it's guitars, basses, drums, uh, computer apps, um, computer tools, um, music tech stuff, um, synth, you know, keyboards, synthesizers. I think um, right now in the current moment, one of the things that we're trying to figure out what to do about is, um, you know, up to 30% of American households do not have the internet or, or don't have it at a level sufficient for continuous online learning. So, um, you know, we're trying to figure out how can we get lessons to children who are cut off from the internet. Um, uh, and so and it's a challenge. It really is. But it's like, like anything, no pain, no gain. It's worth it. Our kids are worth it. So we're doing things where, um, you know, certain districts, you know, our kids often get two meals a day from their schools, breakfast and lunch. And in regular times, they can just have that there. But now a lot of times they're being delivered. So while that's being delivered, we can send lessons, we can send instruments. Um, so we're finding those ways. And, and in terms of like gear in general, because I know like I'm having the privilege of speaking to a <laughs> producer of, of fantastic <laughs> gear. Um, when, when we're not in COVID times, Little Kids Rock buys and donates huge quantities of musical instruments and musical products every year to the schools that we serve. And the instruments that we donate are all those ones that I just sort of said. You know, um, there's an equity issue in music education. So if I look at the five most popular genres of music education, excuse me, of, of music in the United States today, they are in this order. Rap is number one by about a point, followed by rock, followed by pop, followed by R&B, no, excuse me, followed by Latinx or Latin, and then followed by R&B. If you look at those five genres together, they account for over 70% of the music that all Americans of all ages, races, classes, and genders listen to. And Little Kids Rock is just trying to get those musics into schools so that kids can see themselves reflected in their music education. And that's powerful and meaningful to a child because it tells a kid, hey, I belong here. You know, I mean, I, I will tell you that, you know, seeing a metal detector when I go to one of our schools sends a really strong, I think, negative message to a child. Like, I won't, I'll let the imagination fill in the blanks, but I don't think that's the way we should be greeting our children in the morning. 
greeting them seeing the music that they hear at home, greeting them seeing music made by people that might look like them or music from people that they know and love and inspire them sends a very different message. So since then, you have been highlighted by a lot of national and local media outlets, including the New York Times. I mentioned you did a TED Talk, uh, CNN, Times Magazine, MTV, the list goes on and on, even the Dr. Phil show. I don't want to leave that one out. <laughs> um, to name a few, how has this helped elevate the voice of Little Kids Rock and how else can people help you elevate this program? Well, we don't we don't pay for any publicity, so it's all... People can do exactly what you did, to be honest, uh, Jamie. You guys heard about our program. You'd known about it. You reached out, wanted to talk to us. They can also, um, you know, tell people about us. That's, you know, so much of our growth has come from word of mouth, as I was mentioning. You know, um, yeah, even, even recently, it's funny, like Carlos Santana was one of the first artists who ever supported our program. He's still very involved. He just played at our virtual benefit event a, a few months ago. Um, but I would say, you know, reach out to us, introduce us to people that you think might be helpful. Um, we're looking for great people to join our board of directors. We're looking for wonderful people to join our staff. We're looking for wonderful people just to come up with cool and creative ways to help and get involved. Sounds great, David. Thank you so much for all of that. Um, we found out a lot of great information, so make sure you guys tune in. You check out their page. They have a lot of um, information to offer there as well on how to become a part of this wonderful program. So, David, do you have a time for uh, some fun questions? Of course, please. All right, let's do it. So if you could collaborate with any artist or influencer, who would that be and why? Wow. Well, <laughs> if I could collaborate with any influencer ever in history... Sure. Pull your list out. I know you got one. <laughs> Boy, I would study like a child at the feet of someone like um, John Lewis okay. or Pablo Casals or like, so Pablo Casals said, we, you must worry. For those of you who don't know, Pablo Casals is like, he's, he's long gone, but he was a wonderful cellist for, who, who survived World War II and saw a lot of the, the, the brutality that that visited on the world. And he said, you know, we must, you must work, we all must work to make the world worthy of its children. And I was like, that. wow, I want to learn from that dude. So, and then if I had to make a hit record, I, I, I mean, I would love to have worked with John Lennon, you know, that would be insane. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. But those guys first and, or, or mother Teresa or someone like that. I just like people who I look at and feel like, wow, if I ever grow up, I want to be like that person. Great choices. So you have demonstrated some fun and interesting ways to show that we are all musical. For example, you taught a whole crowd to play the Rolling Stones, Journey, Adele, and Lady Gaga in under 10 minutes by using boom whackers. <laughs> How do you come up with these ideas? And also, can you explain to people what a boom whacker is? A boom whacker is just a little hollow tube that when you hit it, it makes a musical note. You know, it's easy if you if you believe as an article of faith that as I do, that everyone's musical, truly, not just lip service people, believe it, then you run these thought experiments of like, well, okay, well, I don't know anything about um, Jamie, but other than that, you're very nice, but I do know that you're musical because you're human. Okay, so I can probably to do certain things that you will be able to do like that. So what you do is you, you know, like now my knowledge of music may be a little more uh, ample than someone who's never tried to make music on an instrument or whatever. So, you know, I, I come up with everything. It's like, okay, so these people will do this with the drumsticks. These people will do this with the boom whacker. And these people, I, I often will do stuff with ukuleles, you know, which is a bit of a pain just because of the tuning, you know, which I never have them do, but I'll have a team of people will tune up. I've done stuff with like 500 ukuleles, you know, <laughs> which takes a lot of pre-work or, or little miniature keyboards. And you just sort of like come up with like, well, what do I know that they can do? And what do I know that they'll be able to do, especially if they're looking at their neighbor and that, that, that the, that, that 
that group communication will bring them in. And that's why, you know, when you go to a rock concert or any concert and the artist starts to sing, a lot of times, you know, you'll see the whole audience joins in. <laughs> but if they were to do it by themselves, they'd probably feel nervous. They might feel For self-conscious. Sure. And they also might not be able to find the notes as well. But when you have 10,000 friends singing that note nice and loud, it makes it easier for you to find where you should go. So that's how I do those things. I leverage the natural musicality of people. And I think of sort of the cheap parlor tricks that will bring it out. And it brings out so much joy in everyone. So we'll probably throw that, that video up there, but you'll just see everyone's just so happy. And it's so fun to create and to create together, I think, more than anything. So speaking of odd instruments, you have definitely demonstrated that there's music in everything and everywhere. What has been one of the most unconventional instruments and or objects you have used to either perform or teach with? The For me, to perform or teach with, I'm going to go with perform. Okay. Um, when I was 17 and just before I picked up the guitar for the first time, my friends and I were sitting around, we were seniors or whatever, maybe I was 18, I forget, but I know it was a senior. It was that fun summer where you're like, woohoo, I miraculously made it into a college somehow <laughs> and now I'm done with high school. And we were playing Not Fade Away. Well, we, my friend Paul was playing it on his guitar and I was drumming on the hood of my car. And that, dr that car hood and his guitar and my friends all singing that song, I, still all these years later, I just remember it like as one of my fondest memories. And another one, I will say I got together with my friend um, – uh, right after, right uh, after college, and there was a big, this was in uh, RISD, uh, sorry, near RISD in Rhode Island, huge metal statue, and we were just singing and having fun. It was like one in the morning, and luckily, oh, I think we were downtown, so we couldn't really bother too many people because it had cleared out. And we just started banging on this big hollow statue, and it had an incredible sound. And we were singing, and you know, again, I remember it now. So, so that's what I would say. Two fairly unusual objects that are in, in, inextricably linked to two of my favorite musical moments in life. Uh, one with an audience of five friends and one with just me and my friend Avner. Awesome. So you have helped restore and revitalize music education for over a million students. What has been one of the most memorable moments you can't stop talking about? Well, recently... Um, and I, and I can send you a video link to this. We had a virtual benefit event and this, this, this child wrote a song recently about this moment we're living in called keep fighting. I heard it and was astonished because it's just so beautiful. And I wanted to surprise her. So we invited Vance joy to perform her song with her without telling her and we invited bonnie Raitt to to introduce them and the look on her face is every teacher's dream i know you're scared right now i know i'm not there right now and so that has been something that I've just like, I've watched it a hundred times. I really, I can't even tell you. And it's like, it's joy. It's just a picture of joy. And that's what music can do for kids. And that's why I love this work. I and mean, to call it work sometimes feels like a misnomer. That's why I love this journey. That's why I love this path. I would definitely agree with that. So last but not least, um, who would play you in the movie of your life, David? <laughs> People have said Jack Black, but <laughs> I love that. If do, I, do you do the eyebrow thing? Is that something? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there, there you go. There you go. <laughs> um, I personally, if I could pick, I would, and you know, and it could be anybody. Uh, I would probably pick Gene Wilder, perfect. whose performance in that movie, my favorite movie of all time, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, transfixed <laughs> me as a child. But also, um, I, I guess I'll, I'll close by saying, I don't know if you remember that scene, 
but Veruca Salt was about to lick the wallpaper that tasted like the food it looked like. And, she, and he's like, lick anything you want. Lick a strawberry, it tastes like a strawberry. Lick a blueberry, it tastes like a blueberry. Lick a snozberry, it tastes like a snozberry. And Veruca says, snozberry? Who's ever heard of a snozberry? <laughs> and just as she's about to lick the wallpaper, he grabs her cheeks and says, we are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams. And what I learned as a grown-up, semi-grown-up, uh, later when I, I Googled that, and he was quoting a poem. And that poem goes on to say, it says, we are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams, world losers and world forsakers upon whom the pale moon gleams, yet we are the movers and shakers of the world forever it seems. Now, the term movers and shakers appeared for the first time in the English language in that poem. Wow. And that author was not talking about Wall Street power brokers, and they were not talking about generals or presidents. They were talking about musicians, artists, the unacknowledged legislators of humanity since time immemorial, the people who make the art help define the society as much as the people who are legislating. So if, I, so if there was time travel and anybody had enough interest to make a movie about me, I would <laughs> definitely want Gene Wilder playing me. I loved that answer, especially with the hat. So thank you for all of that. Um, well, David, this has been wonderful. Is there anything else that you want to share with our listeners um, about Little Kids Rock, about yourself, any upcoming um, news that we want to share? Um, only that, you know, your support now of music education really means more than ever before because music means more to our children now, especially now. So if you're in a position to support, please do. If you're in a position to connect us to people who can, please do. And a message about you, the listener. Never doubt your own musicality. Never doubt your own creativity. Never doubt the, the power that you have to make a difference in the world with your music, with your song, with your love of music, um, and of your fellow citizens. And vote on November you know, 4th, please. That's all I've got. Thank you, David. Thank you. That's David Wish, everyone. Again, this is the Ins and Outs with Mackie, a show about awesome gear and awesome people. We'll be bringing you musicians, engineers, podcasters, streamers, and sometimes the occasional Macoid. If you're new to the channel, make sure to hit that subscribe button on your favorite platform to get all the latest Mackie updates as soon as they are out. Until next time, Macoids. It's the ends and outs, ends and outs.